Right there, almost. Yay! There you go. From a group of inner city youngsters right. learning how to snorkel at the Marine Resources Development Center. We're going to be paddling into the uh, Everglades. To a we kayaking gear, club, a setting out on a nature tour to, to Everglades National Park. Florida Bay, off the coast of Key Largo, is used by millions of outdoor enthusiasts every year. Monica Wall has owned and operated Florida Bay Outfitters for over 14 years. Our business is a nature-based business. Um, kayaking, canoeing, of course, people want to paddle somewhere where it's really beautiful, get away from, you know, urban areas. If they live in urban areas, certainly they paddle up there, but they like to get away. And no one's going to come to the Keys if, if our nature goes away. The plant and animal populations in Florida Bay have declined over the last few decades. Scientists have found that managing the water quality and quantity in the more northern areas of Florida has a direct impact on the water quality here. You have a certain amount of fresh water that falls on the Everglades. It used to come to Florida Bay. Now it's getting sent to the St. Lucie and the Caloosahatchee. So, the, so they're getting more water than they used to. We're getting less. They both need fresh water, but they both need the amount that they would normally get. Included in the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan is a better way to control the freshwater levels in these rivers and Florida Bay. This will help stabilize the environment and once again allow nature to thrive, ensuring a healthy tourist-based economy. Marion Sink has come to the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge on the northeast fringes of the Everglades to indulge in her lifelong hobby, bird watching. These wetlands serve as nesting grounds for all kinds of wading birds, like the great blue heron, the glossy ibis, and the endangered wood stork. And today, what's really exciting is we've seen a roseate spoonbill, which are usually on the west coast of Florida, but I'd never, ever seen them in this area, so it's really fantastic. Biologist Mark Cook watches birds for a different reason. To him, they're a barometer of the health of the environment. If the bird population is thriving, it means the fish and marine creatures they feed on are doing well too. But today in the Everglades, the numbers paint a grim picture. Over the last century, the number of birds has plummeted by as much as 95%. There used to be reports from the early explorers that the sky used to go dark because so many wading birds were flying overhead. Now, even at conservative estimates, we're thinking that perhaps there was as many as 200,000 breeding birds within the Everglades in, at this time, in the 1930s and 1940s. Now we're lucky to see somewhere between 20 and 30,000 birds in a good year. The levees, dikes, and canals built to drain and develop land in South Florida altered the flow of water that is the lifeblood of the Everglades. The changes destroyed nesting sites and disrupted the food supply. Lawmakers have pledged billions of dollars to restore the glades. In order for this massive undertaking to be successful, however, biologists must understand the complex relationship between the water and the birds. A lot is riding on the success of Everglades restoration. Scientists like Mark Cook and others have been recruited from all around the world to help with its recovery. One hope is that future bird watchers will again see flocks of birds turn day into dusk as they take flight over the Everglades. When travel writer Diane Marshall and her husband John built their retirement home in Key Largo, they took advantage of a Monroe County permitting incentive that allows for homes designed with cisterns for water storage to be built before other homes that have no measures for water conservation. Almost all their drinking, bath, and irrigation water comes from rainwater channeled down from the roof. It then passes through a purification system. Oh, it's worked tremendously. Um, lots of people uh, come to the house asking us questions about it. Uh, the water is very pure, very clean, um, very healthy. It tastes better than the water that we uh, get from by bottled water. Um, and we have reduced our impact on the environment and on the Keys. Cisterns are part of old Florida history. The largest was built by Henry Flagler in the 1920s at the Casa Marina in Key West. It runs underneath the main building and is used exclusively for irrigation. Another, located at the old lighthouse, adds additional interest to this tourist attraction. The more water we use, the harder it is on the entire ecosystem and it, the harder it is on our surrounding waters in the Keys. And we need that to support our tourism, so it does come full circle. 
Billboards on US-1, sponsored by the South Florida Water Management District, leading from Key Largo to Key West, remind visitors and residents how important water conservation is. The truth is, in South Florida, water conservation should be a way of life. Water quality, in addition to water quantity, is an important uh, component of the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. The Loxahatchee Impoundment Landscape Assessment or LILA, is the largest constructed wetlands ever designed for research. What scientists are learning here is helping biologists and engineers restore the Everglades. We're trying to get a better feel for how to get the water exactly right when we go to restore the water conservation areas in the Everglades. A series of specialized pumps allow scientists to control the water, mimicking the sheet flow that once moved unobstructed from Lake Okeechobee into the Everglades. Getting it right is crucial. Too much or too little water can have far-reaching consequences. If the fish don't like it, you could lower the numbers of fish, which then in turn could alter the wading bird population or the alligators. It's taken two years to design and build this Everglades microcosm. Four man-made tree islands now rise from the wetlands, replicas of those that once dotted the Everglades landscape more than half of which have disappeared. We think that there is a way to bring tree islands back just by getting the hydrology right. And that's what we're gonna learn from here. The goal of the Lila project is to ensure that the work done to restore the Everglades is based on sound science, but it's providing other benefits as well. It's also a public benefit because um, it's in an area that's highly visible by a lot of visitors and they can come out and see what the native or natural part of the Everglades might look like. And among those visitors, many future scientists. We are hoping from this experiment to provide a research forum for high school students, for uh, universities, because it is now accessible. Being here at the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge, we can provide an easy research forum. Everglades restoration will take 30 years to finish. By that time, a whole new generation will be contributing to their knowledge to this complex project. What scientists of today and tomorrow learn in this outdoor laboratory will have a major impact on the success of the largest restoration project in history. It looks innocent enough, a homeowner fertilizing the lawn. But fertilizer and the other chemicals we put on our lawns and plants pose a major threat to Florida's environment. After years of improper and overuse, the chemicals have run off into our canals and streams, where they are easily carried into the Everglades. In the same way phosphorus helps lawns and gardens grow, it also helps non-native plants grow faster in the Everglades, choking off the slower growing native species like sawgrass. As a result, the South Water Management District asked major fertilizer makers to reduce the amount of phosphorus in their products. Scott Sincerbo is with Lesco, one of the largest manufacturers of fertilizer in Florida, and a company that has also joined an effort called BMP, which stands for Best Management Practices. Typically, our turf fertilizer had four or five percent phosphorus, and so we've taken that down to two or less now. There are about four million acres of lawns in Florida, Reducing the phosphorus spread on our lawns and gardens by 50% could make a big impact in cleaning up the water in our aquifer and in the Everglades. David Coriat and his wife Lisa run a lawn service in South Florida. Both have been through the education program, and while BMP initially takes more time and effort, they have found it's not only good business practice, but it's good for business. The goal is to protect the environment and to make the customer happy. People don't want harmful chemicals sprayed on their property, especially if they have kids or dogs. Beginning near Orlando and stretching south to Florida Bay, the Everglades is one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. Thousands of species of marine animals and hundreds of species of birds and other wildlife coexist in this vast wetland that once spanned nine million acres. Today, the Everglades is half that size. What remains is bounded by dikes, crisscrossed by canals and levees, and is managed by humans to meet the multiple needs of cities and farms. The heart of the Everglades is water. Once a vast sheet of it moved across the landscape, eventually flowing to the sea. And so in 1904, we began draining the Everglades. Now in 2004, 
an unprecedented effort is underway to undo the damage created by the policies of the past. And even during tough budget times, not one penny has been lost to the restoration of the Everglades. In fact, we've accelerated funding uh, to purchase land faster than what was anticipated. The Everglades restoration plan is a 30-year outline to put the pieces of this ecosystem back together again. About half of the $7.8 billion price tag is from the federal government, and about a third of that money is earmarked to buy new land. Having reassembled the land, we are able to move forward with a project that will basically fill in the canal, grade down the roads, and create a sheet flow to bring back the natural vegetation, the cypress that was here 100 years ago. Symptoms of the need for Everglades restoration are right in our own backyards, even on our beaches. In times of excess rain, water releases from Lake Okeechobee have been blamed for fish die-offs and algae blooms in estuaries and coastal areas. During dry season, demand for water often exceeds supply, raising the very real fear that one day there may not be enough water to go around. It took us 160 years to mess up the state of Florida. It's going to take a little while to get it fixed back and come up with new technologies, new science, new ways of doing things and having people willing to try those new methods. Everglades restoration relies on new technologies and practices to capture, store and deliver excess water in the wet season for use during the dry season. Practices that will ensure adequate water for human needs and for the environment but will also eliminate the need for harmful freshwater releases to the estuaries. Robert Shuford loves going to work every day. Knee deep in mud in the alligator infested heart of the Everglades, he monitors the tiniest of creatures living here, invertebrates like this apple snail. As an aquatic ecologist working for South Florida Water Management District, his assignment is to figure out what water conditions the apple snail and other invertebrates thrive in. A healthy apple snail population ensures that there will always be food for the birds, baby alligators, and fish. We have to understand how this system works. We have to understand its seasonality. We have to understand, you know, uh, what sources of food are, are, are available for certain animals. Bob's interest in marine biology began as a young child watching the adventures of Jacques Cousteau on TV. His research today on the apple snail population is hot and messy. But like many of the scientists working on the Everglades restoration plan, he has his personal reasons. I would like for my grandkids' grandkids to enjoy the same habitats, the same environments that I enjoyed. It's not only just a wetland for Florida, it's a wetland for the world. Longtime Florida resident and businessman Bob Gason remembers the hurricane of 1947. Back then, there was no plan for handling the excess water from the torrential rains of a storm of that magnitude. We had a, uh, a terrible problem of water uh, sitting for uh, virtually weeks and weeks after the 1947 hurricane. And uh, it became a, uh, a problem from the standpoint of the vegetation dying off, uh, a lot of the uh, natural uh, animals not having a place to be able to live and being able to access your, your property for a business or residential use became a perpetual problem during that hurricane time. In response to the devastation, in 1948, a major project for flood control was authorized by the federal government. Canals were dredged from just south of Orlando to Florida Bay to drain the populated areas. The project worked, helping to control the floods, but it also contributed to the decline of the South Florida ecosystem. This water management district now really signals a change in emphasis in terms of the state of Florida. Uh, our early efforts were just to get rid of water. So now our emphasis with our new process, which we call water management, not flood protection, is to make changes to not get rid of so much of the water, but to store more of it, and to provide more of it over a longer period of time to the natural areas like the estuaries and the Everglades. The Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP, is the latest plan by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the South Florida Water Management District designed to strike a balance regarding water issues. In the plan, protecting and restoring the environment plays a key component. Millions of people visit or relocate to Florida every year. The SERP plan is in response to the belief that restoring Florida's natural beauty 
is essential for its economic existence. Regina O'Brien, back to see if you're ready to plunge into some Florida trivia about water. Gene Craven is reviewing the latest radio report he has received for the Everglades Radio Network. It's a new radio broadcast station airing from Naples to Fort Lauderdale. Flies. Thanks for listening to this half hour of Everglades Radio Network. The station runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and is designed to entertain and educate listeners to all aspects of the Everglades. Well, the goal of the project is to provide uh, people with some informational programming about the uh, unique habitat uh, that is the Everglades area so that they might uh, decide to stop and, and take a tour of some of these facilities, spend more time there learn about the Everglades and the, uh, the restoration project that's underway right now. Everything from Everglades history to details about the area's plants and animals makes up the station's program. Radio broadcasts have the potential to reach passengers in the estimated six and a half million vehicles that drive across Alligator Alley annually. The reports are also broadcast over the internet on the to station's know the website. Everglades is to love the, Everglades. If you miss them, the goal of the network's organizers, who include the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Department of Transportation, and Florida Gulf Coast University, is to encourage their audience to appreciate the Everglades ecosystem while making their drive more interesting. These Malaluka trees may look harmless, but they are a serious threat to the Everglades. Malalukas originated in Australia without any natural enemies in Florida to control their growth. The trees have spread like wildfire, and the impact they have on the environment could be just as devastating. Everglades National Park is uh, one of the crown jewels of the National Park Service system. In Everglades National Park, over 200,000 acres of the park are infested by exotic uh, invasive plants. These plants are displacing native plant communities. When native plants disappear, so does the wildlife. In fact, the infestation of exotic plants is blamed for the loss of more than half of the animals that are listed as endangered. In the Everglades, Malaluka is one of eight exotics that threaten the health of the wetlands and the wildlife. Over the last 10 years, uh, the state of Florida has spent over $35 million to control Malaluka in the Everglades, and um, a similar effort is going to be needed to control Ligodium on the tree islands of the northern Everglades and southern areas of Everglades National Park. In the case of Malalukas, cutting them down and treating them with herbicides just wasn't enough. A single tree can produce yeah. as many as 6,000 seeds. Malaluka seedlings were sprouting faster than they could uproot them. The solution lay halfway around the world where the species originated. In this case, Melaleuca is from Australia. So we went to Australia, we looked at the insects that feed on Melaleuca there, we studied them very carefully to determine which insects would feed only exclusively on Melaleuca and would cause the kind of damage that we wanted, which is damage to seedlings and to new growth. The weevil and the psyllid are doing what chainsaws and herbicides couldn't. The insects feed exclusively on Malaluka seedlings, finally putting the brakes on the infestation that threatens the Everglades. This discovery lends new hope that the war on invasive exotic plants can be won with help from Mother Nature.